Hello, I am happy to be here with Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Hello, Julia. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Happy good. to be here again. Yeah, and we're always happy to have you. Um, as usual, the Somerville Media Center and Somerville Journal come together every now and again to uh, hold a news roundup just to figure out what people are talking about in Somerville. Um, so we will start off as we have been for the past few episodes with a uh, coronavirus update. So Julia, what do you have on that? Sure. And I would say it's at this point been a year, Dave. <laughs> it is now March. So for the past year, we've been starting out with stuff like this. Yes. Goodness gracious. Oh, God, I miss the days of doing this in the SMC studio. But here we are. Um, so yes, as always, um, I would love to bring people's attention to the city's COVID dashboard. Um, we've kind of looked at that a number of times, but just so everyone knows it exists, somervillema.gov slash COVID-19, and then you can find the dashboard on that page has good up-to-date data about the number of cases, where those cases are, cases are distributed, the number of fatalities, et cetera. Um, so just a quick update, um, the total number of positive cases is now um, over, it's over 5,000, so we're at 5,254. Um, fatalities have also been increasing lately as there have been more cases, so we have now reached 77 fatalities. Um, but our per percent positivity does remain low, um, below 1% at 0.74%, um, which I know many people have you know, come to know what that means, but basically that does mean that Somerville is at the very least testing a lot of people. So a low percent positivity is good. It means that the percent of tests coming back positive is pretty low, which means that there should be a good amount of tests being administered. Um, so that says something good about kind of our testing infrastructure. Um, but I think a lot of the news around COVID these days is obviously around vaccination. Um, and lately, a little bit about the variants that we're starting to hear more about. Um, so unfortunately, um, Somerville has said that they're kind of a little bit disappointed with the way that the state plan has been rolling out. For example, um, back in early February, um, Somerville actually had some doses that they like had gotten locally to this local board of health and they actually organized a vaccine clinic at the East Somerville Community School. Um, but the state policy changed. So local, so doses are no longer being delivered to local boards of health. They're all being delivered through the mass vaccination sites, the regional sites, or to places like CDS and Walgreens, certain ones, not everyone. Um, that kind of map we've also looked at before on here. So that's another thing to check out. I think the main thing that's changed um, is that kind of like pre-registration link. But again, like a lot of this news is coming down from the state. I wouldn't say that there's a ton more like local information about it. Um, as always, you know, the Council on Aging is, you know, here to support um, seniors through this process because even with the pre-registration link, it can still be challenging for people. Um, I would remind people that Somerville Cambridge Elder Services are offering uh, rides to people who need to get to those mass vaccination sites. Um, so if you don't have access to it or if you have trouble getting somewhere, I would highly recommend getting in touch with them. They're offering uh, free rides to those sites. Um, so there are kind of resources out there. Again, if you go on the summerville.gov website, you can find more information about who's eligible, um, how, like how you pre-register for those vaccines. Um, an important thing to keep in mind is if you do pre-register, that is strictly for a mass site. Um, I'll, I'll just share that, for example, um, my healthcare is within the like mass general like Brigham thing. And I have actually been receiving emails from that provider saying like, we know you're not eligible yet, but like we're on it. You know what I mean? And one of my roommates is eligible and she has her appointment like already booked for the end of March. So it kind of depends on um, kind of what, what you're part of, what network, but if you, you know, want to get in there as fast as possible, definitely just pre-register for that link. You might as well and see if you can get a slot, you know what I mean? As soon as you can. Um, so that's kind of where all that stuff's at. Um, as far as variants, um, this is like, I would say the right word is like emerging, <laughs> emerging information, emerging science. Um, we've all been hearing about this for a while and variants have actually been around for a little bit at this point. Um, we all, I know, have heard that, you know, right, viruses mutate. Um, we know that. Um, it's, you know, part of the reason why there's like different flus and different vaccines, different colds. Um, sometimes they just, they change. Um, so that is happening with this COVID-19 virus, which was expected. It's pretty classic with a kind of infection rate um, that we have. Um, at this point, there are um, 
three main variants, um, one of which is the most prominent. Um, so the UK variant, that's probably, you know, it has like a clinical name, but it's kind of the one everyone's been talking about, right, coming from England. Um, that is the one that has the most cases in Massachusetts and um, nationwide. There's also the South Africa variant, um, which has had a couple cases detected in Massachusetts. And then there's the Brazil variant, um, which thus far, last time I checked, which was end of last week, um, has not had any cases confirmed in Massachusetts, but does have cases confirmed in the nation. Um, there are also other variants, um, but as kind of we all know at this point, we've all lived through this year, we, this is all new, right? So studies on these variants, on the vaccine, on all of this are happening right now. <laughs> so the information is kind of coming out as we go. So for example, there's a California variant, there's a New York variant. There are some studies coming out of them. Some of them are in you know, pre-press. They haven't quite been published or peer reviewed yet. Um, they're looking at the variants themselves, how they're different. Is the vaccine still going to be effective with them? Um, which kind of part of the immune response do these variants affect? Are they more contagious? Are they more likely to lead to illness and death? Um, there's a lot of questions being asked right now. Um, and these studies are underway. Um, I will say that I had the opportunity to speak with um, Dr. Lou Ann Bruno Murtha, which is the Chief of Infectious Diseases at Cambridge Health Alliance. And she was really saying that, you know, while of course, we're learning a lot every day. So, you know, it's hard to say anything definitively that based on what she's reading, you know, I mean, you know, in her scientific journals and like all of that as, you know, a CHA division chief of infectious disease, that she's really optimistic that the vaccines that we have right now are going to be enough to, to really get a handle on this, even including the variants. Because while sometimes the vaccine may not be as effective, like compared to the typical COVID-19 virus, it's still very effective. And it may like your one part of your immune system may remain really strong, even if it impacts a different part. I don't want to get too like scientific into it. There's, we have an article up about this, but basically she's hopeful. Um, the one thing I did um, kind of want to mention is, you know, for example, I think on March, as we are recording this yesterday, March 15th, um, Somerville announced that they were going to be staying back in the reopening plan, even as Massachusetts moves forward. And when I was speaking with Dr. Bruno Murtha, she said that the kind of jump, that jumping the gun on reopening could present problems because viruses mutate the more that they are exposed to a population. So theoretically, the more people who get the virus, the more chances that virus has of changing and mutating beyond the fact that there's also just more chance that these variants will be spread. For example, the CDC was predicting that the UK variant, which is right now the most widespread, may become the predominant COVID variant within the next few weeks. So these, you know, they spread very quickly. So she, she did mention that, you know, of course, she understands like the impact on businesses and she herself, you know, was saying she misses, you know, visiting her daughter and going to restaurants and all that. But she was she's hoping that we can all kind of keep like keep masking, keep distancing, just like keep being careful, even even for like another month or two, like just a little bit longer um, until we have a more like a larger percent of the population that is more armed and protect against this. And as that happens, fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer cases will begin popping up and there'll be less chance of infection and less chance of passing these variants and creating new ones. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, variants are important to think about, but it's also just like in the context of reopening, it's also a good thing to learn about. So um, I'm learning just like everyone else. Um, we just wrote a story kind of looking at this there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, for example, I would point people, if you if you really want to get into the science of it and you're like, wait a minute, like how does this work? The New York Times has been producing some excellent journalism with really great graphics so that you can like see, oh, this spike protein is different from this one. And that, like, it's too much for me to truly explain. But if you want to get into it, there are definitely accessible resources out there for you. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, we would just urge our, our viewers to just uh, stay informed with trusted news websites like like the one you mentioned, um, as well as just uh, staying up to date with the latest information by going to SomervilleMA.gov and Mass.gov uh, just to figure out uh, where you fall in line with vaccinations, what to expect uh, when you do get vac uh, vaccinated, uh, when it when it does 
come your turn in line uh, and for other important information. So yeah, thank you, Julia. Of course. Um, moving on to a, a really hot topic, <laughs> even though it's only March and elections aren't for another few months. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of talk about the mayoral race and some uh, city council races. Uh, so yeah, why don't we delve into that, Julia? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know it's been a minute since we've kind of done another one of these roundups, <laughs> but um, back on March 2nd, Monday, March 2nd, um, during his midterm address, which is traditional for the sitting mayor, uh, Mayor Joe Crudatoni announced that he would not be running for re-election, which at this point, everybody freaking knows. However, um, I think people are still unpacking what that is going to mean for the city. Um, for example, in the it kind of when it just happened, I was like, ah, like what's going to happen? Who's going to fill the void? <clears throat> Curtitoni, um, by the time he steps, like is out of office, he will have been mayor for 18 years. Um, that's a long time. That's the longest <laughs> serving. Uh, I believe so. Yep. In yeah. Oh. Um, so when, and also um, there's kind of, there's not many candidates in the race at the moment. So when he announced he would not be running, there was only one candidate who had officially declared that he would be running for mayor. Um, he is known um, kind of locally as Billy Toro. He's kind of his campaign signs. You'll see say William Billy Toro. Mm -hmm. um, many know his name in one regard or another. For example, his, his kind of signs and posters are all over the city at this point. Um, he is kind of rather a controversial figure, I would say. Um, he is kind of an outspoken um, Trump supporter, for example. He's, you know, shows himself as very conservative. Um, he runs the Somerville News Weekly, which is kind of a local blog slash newspaper, um, which, you know, he writes a lot for, as well as kind of posts local content to. Um, he owns a lot of property in and around the play in, in and around Somerville. Um, and he also, I think, is probably kind of most known, um, you know, by his own, you know, design um, for kind of his his vendetta against Mayor Curtitoni. Um, He's been very outspoken um, about his kind of stance against the mayor, against many of his policies. Um, he's written a book um, about about much of kind of what Curtitoni has done. Um, I will say, kind of as a disclaimer, that I like, I think, you know, for example. Billy Toro knows a lot. He's very well connected, and in my in my job as a reporter um, for the journal, um, you know, he's he's called me up on occasion, and he's got tips, and he is in with a lot of people and city staff. And um, for example, you know, he seems to be kind of beloved by many um, elderly people. I remember I, I got lunch with him back when I started at Mount Vernon in East Somerville, and it was like every person that passed the table was like a handshake and a hug and a hi and like he's he's really well known in, in some communities in the city um and at the same time i will say that it is sometimes difficult for me to parse out kind of what what pieces of what he's saying are true and what may be more kind of a, a vendetta like a, against the mayor and maybe maybe blown out of proportion not calling him a liar um but it, it is kind of something for people, people to consider that I think a big part of why he wanted to run was also about Mayor Curtitoni. And it's interesting now that Mayor Curtitoni is not in the race, what that's going to look like. Um, another big piece of his platform is um, combating homelessness. And that's a lot of work he does as well and supporting elderly and seniors um, in public housing in the city. Um, but he is not, he also doesn't have any experience as an elected official. This would be his first position. Um, he's, you know, kind of this businessman type. Um, so he's, he's one candidate um, who, you know, I still need to do a lot of homework on, frankly. Um, and then the other candidate who declared about a week after Mayor Curtitoni announced he wouldn't be running is Katiana Ballantyne, who we all know as a former council president and current Ward 7 city councilor. Um, so this didn't surprise me. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I, it was because of, you know, her tenure as council president or, um, I don't know. I just, I, my money was on her for running. Um, but, you know, she, I think a lot of people um, expected her to run. She's, you know, very connected. She was very involved in kind of state and national level political campaigns. Um, she's been an outspoken advocate um, for a number of, you know, issues important to several people around um, climate change, around gender equality um, in the city and its, it, and its policies. Um, so she, at, at the moment, it's um, Valentine and Toro are the only two candidates declared for mayor. Um, there's so, 
And also I will note that um, papers are not officially polled until May. Um, so right now people have declared their candidacies, but it's, they're not officially on the ballot until about the end of June mm. um, is when that all gets sorted out. Um, but I don't know, like, I don't know about you, but I feel like this is going to be kind of an interesting kind of like old Somerville, new Somerville race in, in that like um, the old guard or the townies versus like the new progressives and like who will win. And like, it might be interesting, you know, to see how this shakes out um, and also whether more candidates declare because it's March. Right. <laughs> and like I said, yeah. papers aren't due until like the beginning of June, I think mid June and the elections in November you know, right. primary in September. So like we have some time on this stuff. So I feel like that's kind of it with the mayor race at the moment. Um, and even though it's early, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the city council race because yeah. in the last few weeks, there's been just a flurry of people declaring that they are going to run. Um, and what we know now is um, obviously given that Valentine is running for mayor, she is not running for reelection in Ward 7. Um, Mark Niedergang announced in December, I want to say that he would not be running for re-election in Ward Five as city councilor, and um, Mary Jo Rossetti also recently announced that she will not be running for re-election as councilor at large. So that's already kind of three spots that are just open. So that's already kind of a big thing. And then, um, you know, we have four new candidates for councilor at large: um, Justin Klikota, Eve Sidecheck, um, who is an openly transgender woman; um, Charlotte Kelly, Willie Burnley Jr. A black man. Um, many of those candidates, I believe, Eve, Charlotte, and Willie, are all um, Boston DSA candidates, so Democratic Socialists of America, which is kind of a progressive leftist organization, um, which is national, but th there's a, a Boston chapter. Um, in Ward 7, there's two candidates declared, Becca Miller and Judy Pineda Neufeld, um, I believe just declared. Um, and then in Ward 5, um, it's not a contested race at this time, but a while back, Tessa Bridge announced that she would be running um, in Ward 5 for city councilor. So we'll see what happens, but I feel like kind of whatever way you cut it, like we're going to have, we're going to have a new council. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and I were talking beforehand and it kind of reminds me of the 2016 race when we had uh, a, a bunch of new city council uh, members that came in on the, our revolution Somerville ticket. Um, so this this race uh, between the, the mayoral race and the city council uh, race, uh, it has the potential to be that kind of shakeup. Indeed. Something to watch out for, um, and we certainly will uh, from here on out, uh, it'll be an interesting uh, electoral year to follow. Um, next up, there was a, a rally to reopen schools. Um, so uh, what, what can you tell us about that there, Julian? Sure. Um, so last time we spoke, we talked a little bit about education um, and kind of just the energy around reopening or closing or like what's going on with schools in Somerville. So this is a little bit more of that. So on Saturday, March 13th, um, an organization known as SPISO, which stands for Somerville Parents for an Equitable and Safe Opening, organized a rally outside the new Somerville High School, um, calling on the district to reopen schools for full time in-person instruction immediately. Um, they're at saying that, you know, the science supports this, that Somerville has enough, you know, scientific um, and, you know, enough kind of strategies to, to mitigate and manage COVID, um, you know, through the PPE, through ventilation and filtration, through, um, you know, hygiene and hand washing, through distancing, through, you know, plexiglass, like all of the different things that the schools have in place, the parents are saying, we're ready for this, we're ready for this now. Our students have been out of classes for a year. It needs to happen. There's an impact being had. Um, what I thought was interesting about the rally um, was the kind of focus on um, language access and also representation. Um, so one of the, a space of organizer named uh, Beatrice Gomez, um, she made a point to whenever she was sharing information about kind of who was there, just kind of announcing things. She would share information in both English and Spanish um, and said that, you know, she was doing that, she is bilingual and she was doing that to acknowledge the more than 40% um, Latino student body in Somerville. Son los padres de la familia cuyos niños tuvieron que quedarse en casa. 
Han sido afectados los padres cuyos hijos no podían sentarse solos frente a la computadora sin la ayuda de un adulto. Han sido afectados los padres que tuvieron que decidir entre trabajar o... Ellos no se suponían que tan corta edad se tenían que sentar. And she said that, you know, she talked about how, like, you know, this group, Spaceo, had formed last year. It was its parents and medical professionals, um, you know, just advocating for the district to follow the science when it comes to reopening schools. Um, and that they're still advocating for it with over, you know, 420 members now um, because, you know, they, they believe that, you know, education is an important part, obviously, of an equitable future for children. Um, But, you know, they had a, a parent, a special needs parent who was also an Everett school teacher um, speak. They had a woman named Paula who is an Argentinian immigrant, a scientist, a parent, a PTA officer in East Somerville, who spoke about kind of how, you know, she had to meet challenges at her biotech company with flexibility and how she hopes that the district can do the same here. And she specifically spoke about the challenges of Hispanic families in the situation that, you know, after losing their income, you know, finding other ways to make ends meet and suffering just from COVID, they had to just do like a crash course in like internet connectivity and digital literacy and educational technology and all of it. And with like very little training and support and um, that they, they showed a huge level of adaptability um, and, you know, kind of rose to the challenge. And she hopes that the district can do the same um, kind of to the point being that like COVID is here to stay. I think we're kind of learning and even with vaccination where I think parents are eager to, to say, hey, like we need to figure out a solution to, to, to get our kids in classrooms safely. Like, you know, they're advocating for, you know, obvious immediate like vaccination of teachers so that teachers can obviously be safe as well. Um, but they're saying like, no, it's time. And like COVID's not going anywhere. So like we have to figure it out. Remote learning can't be the only solution that we have is kind of like what they were sharing. Um, they had a student speak, a ninth grader who her comments were tough to, tough to listen to. I and mean, she was just sharing how like she used to love school. And like, you know, this year she like joined all these clubs trying to make friends, but has just found herself like, you know, lonely and sad and um, just burnt out. Um, mm. So it was it was an interesting event. Um, a number of elected officials attended. Um, Katiana Valentine was there. Um, Councilor Large Bolimba, Kristen Stretzo were there, as well as a school committee member, Laura Patone. Um, and, you know, a number of parents, some parents there to advocate for their own children, some parents there who said to me that they were really there to advocate for others. Because, you know, I had one parent say to me, you know, like, of course, I want my kids in school, but like, I'm fine. You know, I have the ability to hire a tutor for my kids, but I know a lot of people don't. And I think that we need to be talking more about this. So it was a really interesting event. Um, and, you know, I think the conversation about this is ongoing. Um, we spoke about this in our last roundup, but there are now some some students in schools. So Somerville's hybrid reopening plan for in-person learning has begun. Um, but it's, I think, much slower than what parents want to see and even what the state is saying should happen at this point. Um, so again, like, I think we'll, we'll kind of see what shakes out in the next few weeks, um, but adv advocacy is definitely continuing kind of in yeah. And the state is saying, um, If I if I read this correctly, grades one through three, uh, starting full time at the beginning of April, is that is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, and then it's through. Oh, I'm afraid of being incorrect, but it's through five or eight by the end of April, I think. But yes, there are now some hard deadlines set on on when students need to be in classrooms. Right. And, and you know, as as we've maintained all along, you know, this this sort of planning for all these different scenarios and deadlines, um, you know, like in a lot of instances, there's uh, a plan for in-person learning, and then there's a plan for hybrid learning, and then there's a plan for complete remote learning. And to have all these different plans in place, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot to ask of teachers, of, 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 of the, the people on the school committee, of parents, um, it, and it has been a lot to navigate up to now, and it's not going to get any easier. Um, so yeah, definitely a story to watch out for. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, to wrap up, you have a story about um, diaper distribution. I know, it sounds weird. Um, <laughs> but this, <laughs> reporting this story was so lovely. Um, there's so much wrong, but I think, you know, a kind of mark of this time has also been reporting on the people making it better and like serving their community and figuring out where the gaps in service are and saying, I'm going to go put myself right there. 
Um, and that's been really, really cool to, to get to highlight. Um, so this is just one of those. Um, Marina Sivak, who is the founder of the Beautiful Stuff Project, um, which if you've ever kind of driven through Magoon Square, they have a little shop and it's like this kind of fun sign if you look up. Um, and the Beautiful Stuff Project is its own thing. Um, Marina founded it um, years ago. Uh, she's a former teacher and she founded it as kind of this like way to like re bring like these like kind of like scrap materials, reusable materials like into art curriculum. And she like made it into this like curriculum that she then brings into schools. And she a while ago started working with a few Somerville teachers to bring it into classrooms. Um, and and miraculously has even continued to do things like that in the pandemic, making like treasure boxes and basic art boxes to get to students who may not have materials. Um, but that's not even what this is about. Like <laughs> that's, that's kind of who she is and what she does in the community. But this kind of was born out of her kind of partnership with the schools in the past, but basically like back, back, back in March when this was first happening, she kind of reached out and, um, talked to um, Nomi Davidson, who runs the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative, SFLC, which is a, an SPS initiative. Um, and she said, like, hey, like, what can I do? I know there's, like, needs that are not being filled. Like, what's going on? And Nomi was like, well, like, we've been trying to do this diaper thing for a while, like, get diapers to families because it's really hard to get them out there and people can't really find them anywhere. Um, but it's probably a lot, like, don't worry about it. And Marina was just like, I got this. <laughs> and she just kind of started working with her staff, the Beautiful Stuff Project and working with SFLC staff and like volunteer coordinators and volunteers and has literally in the last year, every week since like the end of last March, which is very quick. Like when I think about where we all were last March, that blows my mind. Um, every week they have been distributing diapers at the food distribution sites that we, we've talked about on here as well. Um, just through the schools to over a hundred families in need. And since then they, they just passed the milestone of over half a million diapers <laughs> distributed over 500,000 diapers wow. distributed, um, which is just nuts. And it's nuts to me just thinking about like, they're working with a pretty small team. So like just the, the, the sheer amount um, is, is just amazing. And I think, you know, They've kind of managed the distribution, um, but the donations have come through a number of places like Cradles to Crayons. They've come through like Target wish list donations, um, individual donations. Um, and it's just like incredible. Like I was just looking at the numbers, like 200,000 diapers through wish list, wish list pr purchases and individual donations. And then another $200,000 through um, like just things to financial like donations. So people would just, you know, if they couldn't donate something, they would just donate money. And then Marina would go out and just buy them in bulk from like, you know, some Costco or BJ's or whatever. Um, but they've made a point to kind of really get these, you know, out to the places that need them. Mm. Um, and I found a couple things interesting in this. One is that I never really knew that like diapers were kind of a resource that was lacking. Like they're not really available at most like food pantries or things like that. And they're not a resource that many people like think to fill um, because they're not necessarily universal, right? Not every single person needs them. Like they would need food or whatever. Um, but they're also incredibly expensive. Um, so having that available to families can free up a significant chunk of money for food, for rent, for whatever else they need. Um, and the other thing that they noticed when they were doing this is um, you know, they were collecting diapers in a number of sizes. So they had different sizes to offer to families. And they noticed that families were requesting bigger and bigger sizes of diapers. Hmm. And they figured out through speaking with families that this was because children were not in like kindergarten, preschool, ki preschool, where they would usually be potty trained and parents didn't know how necessarily. So by this initiative, they figured out that this was another need that parents didn't know how to kind of potty train their own kids. And then the SFLC worked with the Beautiful Stuff Project and others to hold a potty training workshop in five languages, which was well attended um, in order to, I mean, and it helps literally everyone, like it frees up other diapers for people. Um, 
children are more comfortable, parents are more comfortable. Like it was just such a cool thing that like, how, how would we have known that this was an issue, right? Unless there were people just paying attention to this part of, of these people's lives. Um, and I just, I just think this is so cool. Um, anyway, so it's just, it was a lovely story highlighting lovely people um, and just filling a need that, you know, I didn't know about and maybe others didn't. So um, at the moment, you know, they, they're continuing to do this. This is, this remains a need. People are still in crisis, which we all know. Um, so at the moment, they're hoping for some financial donations so that they can go and buy the diapers and other supplies um, for families. Um but they also have a target wish list. Um, both of those you can find at the Beautiful Stuff Project, I think dot com slash donate. Um, but we also have an article up about it. Um, and if you just search the Beautiful Stuff, you can find out more and find out where to donate if you are interested. Um, but yeah, it's just a lovely thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's always great to hear about how the community has been coming together over the past year to uh, to make resources like diapers. Um, like you said, who knew, right? Well, you know, certainly the people that need them know. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that these people were able to 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 make all that happen is is amazing. So, uh, like you said, Julia, if if any of our viewers want to know more, you know, be sure to visit uh, Somerville dot lick <laughs> Somerville dot wicked local dot com uh, to read uh, about any of the stuff that we've talked about today. Um, I have to ask. When you were at the the Mount Vernon restaurant, did you get the twin lobster special? I didn't. Should I have? I don't know. I, like <laughs> I see the neon every time I pass by it. So I'm really curious. I did not. Frank, I have to be honest. I'm not a lobster eater. I know it's a crime to have <laughs> been born in New England and not like lobster. But <laughs> if you ever get it, let me know. <laughs> All right, I will. Um, and we'll certainly let you viewers know about that as well. I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, somervillemedia.org, uh, <laughs> trying to keep track of all these websites, um, and Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal, somerville.wickedlocal.com. Thanks again, Julia. Thank you.